Back in Monogatari is the first, and in my opinion, best of Monogatari's many, many parts. Over the last few months, we've analysed each of the part's arcs, and so we will now finally come to the final analysis video for Back in Monogatari, where we will tie everything together in a nice little bow, and explore the overarching themes and ideas that make this story so special. So if that sounds interesting to you, then strap in for the sixth video in this Monogatari arc analysis series, where we will explore the beauty that is, Back in Monogatari. And if you find yourself entertained at any point during the video, then consider liking, subscribing, and ringing that bell, as I cannot explain to you how much such a small action can do for this channel. Anyway, on with the video. Though before we get to analysing any specific themes, because people won't stop asking for it, let's first explore the beauty that is. Kimino Shirane Monogatari by Supercell is the first and only ending song for Back in Monogatari and in my opinion is one of the best in the entire series. It is a song about love, quite fitting since Back in Monogatari, as we will soon see, is a story defined by love. And more specifically, it's a song about love sung by a girl in love, as this ending is a song from the point of view of one specific character, the character who is the centre of this opening's visuals, Senjikahara Hitagi. The first word in the entire series is her name, because the whole story could not have occurred without her. As discussed in our Tsubasa Cat arc analysis, Senja Gohara is what Hanikawa wishes she could be, a girl free to be herself who isn't afraid of her feelings. Her love for Aragi, their relationship, is the backbone of Baki Monogatari, and that is why its ending song is all about her love for Aragi. If this is a story about Aragi growing, then is the person who helped him to grow the most not equally as important? Now the visuals of this opening don't paint a particularly clear narrative like some of the openings do. We see all the part's major characters doing very in-character stuff, but there isn't a large overarching narrative. Hajikuji is shown laying on her back, possibly a reference to how she was taken down by Aragi. Next along is Kanbru doing something sus to a set square, which is most likely symbolic of her love for Senjigahara, since usually she is represented by stationery. And then Aragi is on his beloved bike, trying to do a wheelie before falling over. This could be a reference to when he's hit off his bike by the Rainy Devil, or could be him metaphorically falling in love since he only falls once he passes Senjigahara. And this does coincide with the lyrics, it's lonely like that, since he has no friends and all. I don't know, that could be a bit of a reach. In the background we also have the figures of Hanikawa, Oshino, Sengoku and Shinobu. Hanikawa is reading a book while looking away from Senjigahara, perhaps in reference to her envy of her and Aragi's love. Oshinam is depicted as a scarecrow, not only does this reference his dishevelled appearance, but also how much like a scarecrow he is a deterrent, both in that he gets rid of oddities, but also in how he acts as a warning for those who play the victim and don't save themselves, other ones doomed to be in despair. Sengoku is kneeling with her hands over her heart, maybe this is how she holds her true feelings in, she is protecting them and so her heart from the outside world. And lastly, Shinobu is stood gazing off into the distance, a reference to how she is not the focus of the series, with Aragi purposely not looking her way. Of course, these are all just my best guesses, and these could just be poses for the sake of poses. Now, you may have noticed some of these characters are in focus at the forefront of the scene, and others are in the back. Now, there probably is a reason for this, but I'm honestly not too sure what it is. At first, I thought it was those characters who Senjigahara had strong feelings for versus those she didn't. But that doesn't explain Hajikuji being front and centre, so if anyone's got any better ideas, comment them down below. Also in the last few episodes, some additional characters are added right at the start of the opening, with Hanikawa with cat ears, a reference to the re-emergence of Black Hanikawa, Sengoku staring at her shadow, possibly a reference to her other side that she is not willing to show people, Hajikuji snailing on the ground, uh, Araki Senjikahara playing Jank and Po. Hanikawa is sleeping on the floor, maybe a reference to how at home she doesn't even have a bed. Sengoku doing something I'm not really sure about, and Kanbru showing off her ass. And then there's a wholesome scene of Shinobu and her two caretakers, so again if you have any interpretations of these, then leave them in the comments. Now another thing you might have picked up on is the colour scheme. The opening starts in black and white, then shifts the colour once the other characters appear. This seems to be quite clear bit of symbolism for her being alone, hence the black and white, and then finding new friends and rekindling old ones, hence the colour. This is backed up by the lyrics, since when it turns to colour, the lyrics say, There's Orihime, I found her at last. Which may seem like gibberish, but trust me, it'll make sense in a bit. Next we see stars falling from the sky and surround Senjigahara. Now these stars represent love. Senjigahara allows herself to be surrounded by love. Also notice the red figures behind her. 
I think this is her trauma, visions of her mother and the cult member. This is why her eyes are shut. She is no longer looking back at the past but moving forward towards her love. Her love being the thing that is both protecting her and guiding her. The figures are red because they are danger, but then it turns to white as it's no longer anything that can hurt her. And in turn the stars turn red, not because they are dangerous. No, this represents love. With her finally opening her eyes and clutching her heart, because the only thing she needs to focus on is the feelings in her heart. Now in the last few episodes of this part, we do get two alternate ending sections to this ending. Neither of which has much of a clear narrative, just showing more of the characters doing random stuff, with the only symbolic part being the endings. With Hanikawa turning into Black Hanikawa, as the lyrics say, these feelings of mine, since Black Hanikawa is her true feelings brought to the forefront, or Sengoku holding a heart, which could be symbolic of her hiding her true feelings. Now this is all well and good, but wait till the lyrics get involved, and then it gets great. Now first I have to explain the story of the cowherd and the weaver girl, which you may think, what the hell is that? But you soon understand. It's a story about Orihime, the daughter of the Sky King and the cow herder Hikaboshi. Orihime is said to have lived on one side of a river where she weaved cloth all day, while Hikaboshi lived on the other side herding his cow. These two characters are represented by the stars, Vega and Altair, and are on different sides of the Milky Way, or in Japanese, the Heaven River. Orihime spends all her day working, but becomes sad because she is lonely. Her father then brings over Hikaboshi to keep her company, and the two fall in love. As a result, they both stop weaving and cow herding, and as such are forced to be separated by the Sky King. Orihime begs to her father, and eventually he agrees, letting them meet on the seventh day of the seventh month, the Tanabata, which is Senjigahara's birthday, and also the date of her and Aragi's first date. Also, it's fun to note that in the story, Senjigahara's dad was the one to drive them to their date, like how Orihime's father allowed the two to meet in legend. In the legend though, the two cannot find a bridge to cross the river, and instead need the help of a flock of magpies, who take pity on Orihime, creating a bridge for her with their feathers. These magpies being the third star in the summer constellation, Deneb, which in real life sits smack bang in the middle of the Milky Way. The three stars, and as such the three characters in the legend, represent our three main characters in Bakemonogatari. Orihime is Senjigahara, a girl who became sad and found meaning in life through love, Hikaboshi is Aragi, the guy who saves her from sadness, and the magpies are Hanikawa, the girl whose name means wing and river, and like a magpie's feathers, is represented by black and white, either by Kako, the tiger, or black Hanikawa, a white cat. She acts as the bridge for Aragi and Senjigahara's relationship, taking pity on Senjigahara and supporting her relationship with Aragi. So now with that knowledge in mind, let's go through the lyrics. First we have, that's Deneb Altair Vega, the summer triangle that you pointed out. This sets up the story of the cowherd and the weaver girl. The lyrics say that there is Orihime, but where's Hikaboshi? That without him, it's lonely. This is Senjikahara feeling lonely and sad at the start of the story, because she is yet to meet Aragi. The opening becomes colourful here, the colours almost like a sunrise, because Senjikahara's dark and depressing past is finally ending, and a new happy day is arriving. This is why Hikaboshi is mentioned, because by reaching out and trying to pursue love, she saves herself. The song talks about looking up from a black world at the stars above. The stars are said represent love. Since the story of the stars, the cowherd and the weaver girl, is a story of love. The stars are ready to fall as the love they represent is ready to fall on Senjigahara. The lyrics say, I wonder when it was that I started chasing after you. This being Senjigahara's pursuit of Aragi and her saying, don't be surprised at them and understand them. This being Senjigahara's pursuit of Aragi and her saying, don't be surprised at them and understand them, is her fears and insecurities about confessing to Aragi. This song then being about her love for Aragi, how it saved her and how she acts on it to confess to him, or you know, the first two arcs of back in the Gottery, which I think all lines up quite well with what I said about the visuals. Another interpretation could be that the stars represent literal stars and that Sendakara's only friends before meeting Aragi was the night sky itself. It's definitely a possibility. Now the most beautiful part of this though to me is how these lyrics seem like a perfect extension of the conversation between Aragi and Sendakara in episode 12 their date, the Tanabata. To speak frankly for a minute, I didn't notice this to my second rewatch of the series, and well as I've said on this channel before, when I first watched Back in Monogatari, I didn't really think it was anything special, but by the time I was on my second watch, I was already in love with the series. And so when I finished episode 12 on the second watch, and this ending started playing, and I saw the words, that's Deneb Alter Vega, 
my jaw quite literally dropped. I was absolutely flabbergasted at how the ending itself was just one big bit of foreshadowing for what is probably the most important moment in all of Bakamalagotari. It genuinely did bring tears to my eyes, and it might possibly have been the moment I came to understand that this series really was the best piece of fiction I'd ever seen. It moved me a lot, and as such I hold this ending very dear to my heart, as it's a perfect demonstration of how much everyone involved in this production cared for this story. That all said, Ryo, the writer of the song, did say that they didn't want to copy the tone or style of the original Bakamonogatari novels because he felt the author Nisha Ishin would enjoy the song more if it was more original. Thus, Ryo wrote a different song after borrowing the general setting of the novels. So yeah. Still, as I've said many times, a meaning whether intended or not by the creator is still equally valid. <laughs> now, I don't think it's a revolutionary statement to say that Bakemonogatari is a big old metaphor for personal issues, with the series' oddities just being allegories for very real and common issues we all face. But even if it's obvious, it's obviously quite important. The oddities in the series, although representing different things, like the burden we carry with the weight crab, or the parts of us we refuse to acknowledge with the monkey's paw, all represent one key idea. They are all ways of running away, ways of not accepting reality and not acknowledging your problems. It's the classic save yourself all on your own. To save oneself, you have to acknowledge you have a problem. It may seem like an obvious thing, and in a way it is, but even if it seems easy on paper, in reality it is not. Admitting to faults, agreeing you have a problem, it's hard. And that's what these oddities mean. They are the excuses we make to not help ourselves, the understandable reasons we use to not face the reality of our grief and trauma. Overcoming these issues is hard, and that's why we form coping mechanisms, why we rely on oddities. As well, we all have oddities, be them healthy or not. We have things we do to avoid stress, things we do to not think about the bad parts of our lives. And so the lesson Monogotary teaches us about this is simply that yes, it's hard, but the reward for doing so is worth it. Because if you do overcome it, you do push through, you will save yourself. Nobody else can make you overcome these issues. It has to be you. You have to do it yourself, as only then can you truly say that you saved yourself all on your own. I have already made a whole video on this subject, so I recommend you check it out after this video. But for the sake of being comprehensive, all five of the Bakay girls have been shaped by their parents in one way or another. Senjugahara gave up her weight to the crab because of the burden of the feelings she felt towards her mother. Hajikuji died trying to visit her mother. Kamru was given the monkey's paw by her mother. Sengoku was nothing more than a doll for her parents, just being the cute daughter they wanted her to be. And Hanikawa was in an abusive household by her neglectful parents. All of their issues are in some way tied back to their parents. This ties into the overarching idea of coming of age. Our cast, by overcoming their issues, mature and come of age. It's not uncommon for parents to see their children as extensions of themselves. The parent knows best and so the child should do what they say without complaint. But children aren't just children, they are people. They are their own individuals separate from the beliefs of their parents. A big part of growing up, of becoming adult, is leaving your parents behind. Not in a cruel way though. It's not about cutting ties, it's about recognising you are not defined by them. That you are your own person and that you are not defined by your parents and their actions. This is why the five Bakke girls, each in order to eventually save themselves and come of age, have to break free from their parents and the expectations and beliefs they have pushed on them. Senjigahara has to take on her mother's feelings and then move on. She has to move past them and not let herself be weighed down by the thoughts and feelings of her mother. To mature and save herself, to find love, she has to leave her mother behind and become a woman in her own right. Hajikuji had to accept that the home she constantly searched for was gone. She had to understand that her parents' divorce happened and that she couldn't go back to those happy family days, no matter how far she walked. By accepting the present and not dwelling on the past, she was able to finally make it home and go on to find a new purpose in life, well, in her afterlife. The monkey paw was given to Cambry by her mother as a test to see what her daughter would do, be consumed by her desires or overcome them. Cambry, by accepting her dark vices are still her and then acting on her selfish desires despite that, shows her mother that she can forge and walk her own path in life, coming of age. 
Sengoku has to defy the expectations her parents put on her and stop being their cute doll of a daughter. She has to reach for her own goals, her own dreams on her own. And Hanikao has to find a home for herself, realising that her parents aren't right just because they are her parents and that she doesn't need to act like a model daughter just to please them. And although a lot of these don't occur till later parts of the series, the seeds for all these character arcs were planted here in Bakemonogatari. If Kizumonogatari is about Araki coming to understand the importance of friendship and connection, realising that isolation isn't healthy, then Bakemonogatari is Araki putting this lesson into practice. At the start of the series he has but one friend, Hanikawa, and by the end he has five. Each of these girls he befriends is one new vital connection. Him relying on each of them to help him find Shinobu is a testament to the power of connection, which is why the moment of him coming to realise they are helping him for no other reason than that is what friends do is so powerful. Aragi is Aragi. He is dense because he looks away from those things he doesn't want to look at. Even if he came to appreciate friendship, his old ways still persisted. This is why he said that none of them would save him, the people only accept help selfishly. He doesn't want to admit to the truth, he doesn't say what he really thinks out of fear. Yet he gets called out by Black Hanikawa no less. By Hanikawa, his first friend, by the person who wishes people cared for in the same way they do for him. She said by saying all this he is as good as rejecting them and so he is forced to look back at reality at his friends. He thinks that they'd all be sad if he died and it's in that moment that he asks Shinobi to save him because he acknowledges that he has something to live for, and that is, his friends. His arc then is going from having no friends, to not only relying on said friends, but fighting to live, not for his own sake, but for theirs. Because worse than even his own death is making them cry. Which says a lot about his still rampant self-sacrificial nature, but also shows some clear character growth towards a man whose intensity as a human is still pretty strong, even with five friends hanging around. Bakke Monogatari might as well be called Koi Monogatari because it's all about love. The first arc is a girl falling in love with Aragi, the second is said girl confessing to him, the third is unrequited love, the fourth love turned to hate, and the fifth a girl once again confessing but this time being turned down. No matter where you look, love is everywhere in Bakke Monogatari. Be it romantic or familiar, love is what defines all the characters in this part, be it accepting love or rejecting it. Each and every character has to confront the love of another and process said love. Love can cause pain and distress, but it can also save someone from sorrow. The idea I think Bakum and the Gottery is trying to express overall is that love is messy. It is not good or bad because love isn't some universal concept. No, it is the feelings of an individual and that individual alone. It can make you do bad things, but also change you and help you become a happier person. Love can save the day, it can bring salvation, but it can just as easily cause sorrow and hardship. Because love is just a one-sided feeling. Only when it is mutual, when both parties are in love, can a relationship be formed. And as shown in this part, that is what brings strength. That's what increases your intensity as a human. It is a relationship of mutual love. Be it Kanburu, Sengoku's classmate or Hanikawa, those with one-sided crushes not only cause themselves pain, but also those they direct said love on, as love is dangerous, but relationships are salvation. Once again, I covered a lot of this in the last video on Tsubasa Cat, but Aragi's arc across back in the Gottery is the strong narrative through line that ties this part all together. In brief, it consists of a few key points. Him gaining friends and learning why that gives you power as already discussed, him coming to accept the cruel truth that victims aren't always victims, that sometimes trauma can be self-inflicted, and most importantly, him putting himself first, not risking his own life to save Hany Cowers when it's none of his business. His self-sacrificial nature is one of his biggest flaws, and as such this part climaxes with him deciding not to die to fix the issue. It's obviously just the first step, but like in real life, improvement is slow and a steady process. And this here is just the beginning of his overall journey, which I fully explore in this video here. Back in the Gottery, as already said, is my favourite part of the series, as it to me personifies all of what makes Monogatari great. Heartfelt stories of people bettering themselves, lessons we can take into our own lives, and a overall through line that develops all the characters in meaningful ways. But more than all that, the reason I love Back in the Gottery so much is because of how it came to be. If you didn't already know, 
Nisho Ishin first wrote Bakim and the Gottery without any intention of publishing it. He didn't write it for work as an author, no he wrote it in his own free time, in breaks, between his serialised light novels. And why did he write this two volume epic in his free time? Because he just wanted to write some fun dialogue between characters. The simple fact he wrote a story just for that, and it was not only good, but arguably his greatest work ever, really is insane to imagine. But what this really says to me, is that Monogatari is out of all of Nishuishin's works, the one most true to who he is. Because the story wasn't meant to be published, it wasn't meant to keep readers engaged, not meant to appeal to anybody. It was just for his own amusement, just a man writing about something he wanted to. Now you probably don't know this, but I'm somewhat of an aspiring author. Maybe that's not the right phrasing, as I too don't like to write to expectations. I write because I like to. I write stories I want to write, I write for myself first and foremost. I sometimes feel I need to write a more mainstream story, like a revenge thriller or something like that, as that is what people seem to want to read. But then I think back to Back in the Gottery and remember that I'm writing because I like it. And so I want to write what I want to write, no matter how dumb or stupid the story may sound. Back in the Gottery has inspired me as an author more than any other piece of fiction. Not because of the story itself, but because of what it represents. That if you write what you like, then that is okay. The epitome of this to me is my series People of Fate. Each volume is four short stories. There is an overarching narrative, but not one you'd grasp at first. It's not a particularly marketable or smart way to write a story. The fact I do all my art with myself and my shoddy drawing talents only adds to that unmarketability of these novels. But the reason I do all this is because I want this series to be me. Every aspect of it is mine. Even the illustrations I do myself because I want this story to be the embodiment of myself and what I enjoy. It's a story I'm writing for myself and so I'm giving it all of myself. And the fact I have the confidence to publish such novels, ones that so blatantly reveal who I am as a person, is because I've seen Nisho Ishin do the same and never have regretted it. As that is what Back in Monogatari means to me, and that's why it's so special to me, as it's inspired me in a way no other piece of fiction has. Overall, Back in Monogatari is a piece of fiction that says a lot. It teaches us about the nature of love, of growing up, and how saving ourselves is only possible by our own hands. It is not only an inspiring work, but one that still feels grounded, Yes, it teaches us lessons, but also that acting on them is not easy. The life is hard, people are layered, and then to become happy, you have to put the effort in. As no one is born happy, happiness is something you have to attain for yourself, with your own hands. Or at least that's what I got out of this monster story, or you could say, this back in monogotary. And if you want to go the extra mile in supporting this channel, then consider pledging to my Patreon, where for as little as £2.75 a month, you can get your name at the end of the video, like Ikari Desu, Rinjak9696, General Tonyos, and Mr. Spatum. So with all that said and done, I've been Seth the Sin, the Deadly Sin of Geek, and I'm signing out. Stay safe, everyone.